the new guy at the CDC, up next. Whatever stereotype you're gonna try to put on me isn't gonna fit, that's for sure. Because there's no stopping me. Ask your healthcare provider if Big Tarvi is right for you and visit BigTarvi.com to view the important facts, including important warnings. Welcome to Plus Talk on Plus Life, where we are all about turning positive into a plus. My guest today is Dr. Dimitri Daskalakis. He is the new CDC director for the Division of HIV AIDS Prevention in the National Center for HIV AIDS, Viral Hepatitis, STD, and TB Prevention. My goodness gracious me, Dr. Dimitri, how big is your business card? It's a pretty big business card. You know what they say, big title, big title. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us. And congratulations on the new role. How are you settling into this new life at the CDC? Um, well, I'm really excited to join the CDC. So I feel like, you know, it's, it, it was inspiring enough to move out of New York and move to Atlanta, which is a great city. But literally, you know, for me, it's a culmination of my career. It, it's really, you know, what I was dreaming of what I would do. Uh, in public health, this is where I thought I would land in, in sort of the, the ideal scenario. So it's it's kind of a dream job. Yeah, but how did you decide that public health is where you wanted to go? What moment in your life do you go, I, that's it, that's what I want to do? Um, I think there are a couple of moments, actually. So I think that learning what public health is, um, it didn't happen until later in my career. But from the very beginning, I knew that I wanted to do HIV. And HIV is one of these magical scenarios where public health and personal health are so intertwined that um, that the work is is public health, even when you're taking care of a patient in a room one on one. But then ultimately, I think that I knew I wanted to do public health when I started uh, an HIV testing program in a, a bathhouse in New York City. So I didn't know what that was, that I was actually doing a public health program, but uh, it made me fall in love with the idea of creating programs and creating things to deliver uh, care in a, uh, in a public health manner um, rather than just in a personal care manner. So what's the HIV journey been like for you since you started that testing clinic in a bathhouse to now your position here at the CDC? I mean, it, it all sort of uh, goes to the same place where... It's about listening to the people that you need to listen to to figure out what the right thing is to do. I mean, I feel like I, get, I, I can tell the story of, of, of starting testing in the bathhouse where literally the, the, the sort of tale of one human who acquired HIV infection in that venue inspired me to do testing there. And I mean, ever since then, all I really have done is like listen to what my patients have told me and what advocates have told me and what the science say. And like, like my job is to sort of braid that together in a way that uh, that results in uh, in you know higher quality life for people living with and those who could benefit from HIV prevention. What were those moments like though when you're doing testing in a bathhouse, especially back then? Mm. I mean, the fear, unfortunately, look, it still exists, but I can only imagine what it was like, especially in a place like a bathhouse where men are going to have sex. Well, I'll start by saying the person who was the most scared about doing HIV testing in the bathhouse was me because it was completely uncharted territory. And then what I learned was, you know, I mean, I'll tell you, when I started, there was this whole idea that I would have to have like an idea for how to evacuate people if they freak out because of their result, that it was going to be like, you know, terrible to, to put it there and that it's like invasive. And what I learned was that if you really uh, uh, sort of navigate the culture of where you're working, you end up creating a program that works. And so what I, what I learned was that it wasn't scary. And once I got rid of my own fear about HIV testing and, and delivering a positive result or a negative result, what happened was that people were less scared when I gave them the result. So that was a really important lesson that has echoed to this moment for me. So like the idea that, you know, that, that, an HIV positive result is actually like a moment of great creation. And you're able to sort of move into a space where you can take charge of your health in a way that maybe you weren't doing before. And so once I realized that, yeah, you want to avoid getting HIV, but getting it or having it doesn't mean the end of the world. It means that you can motivate um, some very important actions that really change the course of your own life. You know, and I've got to say, it has completely changed not just the way I treat myself and others, but the trajectory of my life as well. No, I mean, that resonates with me as someone who did public health, who's done public health in this space, because I mean, really, you know, one of, one of the things I remember teaching uh, the people who I trained to be testers and counselors um, in that environment was like, if you if your first response when you tell someone that they have HIV is to start crying yourself, you're not doing them any favors. Like, it's a moment to say, look, like, 
this is news. It's not good news or bad news. It's just news. And so we, we go from there. And so, you know, I think that, that, you know, your moment, I think is one that I've heard through, um, through my patients, through my friends, through my like loved ones. Like it's so common that like that moment, um, and it should be more common, but that moment where you actually uh, take control and say, this is just a thing I've, that's a part of my life. It's like saying I'm mad at my left arm, my left hand or right hand. It's just what it is. And like, whether you like, you know, your manicure on that hand doesn't matter. It's just your hand, right? Yeah. And I, I love that you said it's not good news. It's not bad news. It's just news. Yeah. I mean, like, think about other, other things that people like hear about. So. I mean, like diabetes is my example, a chronic manageable disease, right? So if you find out you have diabetes, you can either look at it as like the end of the world and it's bad news, or you can just be like, well, it's news. And when I get news, I deal with it. I mean, like, you know, you can, you can extend that to other things. And I think it's like hard to sort of, there's some conditions, like if you get a cancer diagnosis, that's a little scarier. And HIV was a cancer diagnosis, right? In effect in like 1991. But in 2021, it's not a cancer diagnosis. It's a diabetes diagnosis. It's a chronic manageable disease. And that, you know, that if you if you take control of that piece and connect to care and realize that this is like, um, again, that moment of creation and not destruction, like it ends up being like a great asset because, you know, you connect to care and not only do you manage your HIV, but you manage your high blood pressure, you manage your, you know, everything. And like, I think that the, the interesting part is that the lesson is so similar in prep for people who were using prevention, like the number of humans who I've started on prep in my life who also find out that they, oh, oops, have hypertension or high cholesterol, and all of a sudden I'm connecting them to care. I'm like, like this is amazing. So I wouldn't have known this because I didn't connect. And it's like, well, this is the lesson that people living with HIV have had for decades, which is like primary care is good. Right, <laughs> like, exactly. Yeah, and we live long, happy, healthy lives. And in some cases, maybe longer than we might have because we're all taking care of ourselves. We're aware of what's going on. A hundred percent. So how do you get through to people though, who, you know, there are people who will still say, you equals you, well, that's not my opinion. And well, yeah, there isn't a cure. How do you get through to the person who still believes HIV is a death sentence? Right, well, I mean, so it, that, there are, that question's complex because it's about getting through to the individual, but also getting through on a population level. And I feel like, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, when you have someone who really finds out that they have HIV, again, the first thing to do is not to be scared of the diagnosis as a clinician. And to say like, look, we got the news, we're figuring it out, you'll go on one pill a day, you're gonna be fine, your viral load will be suppressed, and by, by getting undetectable, you're not gonna transmit HIV to your partners. And I feel like that on the individual level, you gotta say it as a mantra. Like the number of, of people who at the beginning have so much trauma over their diagnosis that it needs to be a mantra that every time that you see them and talk to them, you remind them, this isn't a death sentence, you're doing well, just stick with it. I mean, I remember I had this lovely, uh, this lovely patient who I met, this lovely gentleman who, um, you know, was surprised by his HIV diagnosis. He was actually acutely infected, and the anxiety level and the trauma from that lasted about, you know, fully at that high level about a year. But by the end of the year, he goes, "I finally get it. I'm okay." And you're like, "Yeah, you're right. You did it. That's right. You are okay, and this is the right path." So I think that there's that part on the one-on-one -on -one and sort of in the world, it's just sort of, you know, reminding people, A, from the public health perspective, HIV isn't over. We still have to focus attention on HIV, but B, it is over as a death sentence. And so like we have the technology to prevent and the technology to treat. Okay, so obviously we've been dealing with something else for the past 12 months, COVID. But in your role there at the CDC, I think a lot of people in the HIV community, myself included, think, wow, look at that. They got a vaccine for COVID in a year. HIV, we're still 40 years on, what's going on? Now, obviously they are two very, very different things to talk about, but where is HIV as far as the CDC is concerned? You know, there are people saying they put everything into this to get this vaccine in 12 months. Why haven't they done that with HIV? So, uh, so first, you know, I, I wanna start by saying regarding the COVID vaccine that everyone should get it, like that's clear. Um, the other thing to say about it is, the HIV people should get it, right? Correct. Yep. And especially as as uh, as all of the prioritization opens up, time to get it. So, like, listen to your local your local health departments and the health authorities, and they'll make it clear when you when you're up. But you're up. Everyone's up really soon. 
That's number one. Number two, um, thank you, HIV, for the technology and the infrastructure to lead to a COVID vaccine. So many of the people who you may be familiar with who are researchers that have done work in HIV treatment and prevention and vaccines are the exact people who did research in COVID vaccines. And so uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, HIV, for the infrastructure. So bottom line is COVID definitely put a little bit of a wrench in the story of what we're doing with HIV, but what a massive opportunity. And so what COVID also did is let us get further along to the point where telemedicine is something real. The number of years that we've been trying to get telemedicine to be something real and it not launching in the US was crazy. And so it took a pandemic and now all of a sudden you can go on a phone and have your doctor's visit and it goes great. That's that. Self-testing, that was also a dream. And so now we're like, you know, launching programs where we have hundreds of thousands of testing kits going out to the community. So, you know, I think that COVID, uh, the pandemic has like pluses and, 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 and minuses from the HIV perspective, because even though we have like had some stunting and some like delay in the work that we're doing, we're going to recover. It's going to take a little bit of time. But the innovations that we've gotten through COVID, we can never let go of. And so like not to just not, not to be a Pollyanna, but let me tell you, self-testing and 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 uh, and prep either through telemedicine or HIV care through telemedicine. That's that's the way to go. Fantastic stuff. Thank God. Look, I'm going to leave us with one last question. Just springboarding back to living with HIV. What's your advice for the person yep. at home living with HIV who's terrified to disclose their status to their family, uh, to their loved ones, who's sitting there in isolation? What are your words of advice for them? Yeah. So I, I feel like I, I'm going to sound like uh, RuPaul, which is if you can't love yourself, how are you going to love somebody else? So let's start with my RuPaul, my RuPaul quote and say, like, like, you have to love every part of yourself, including your HIV. Like, it's not your enemy. It's just it's like your right hand or your left hand. And so it's just something that you deal with, just like other people deal with other things. And so my first advice is, like, you're not you're, if you take care of yourself, you're going to be healthy. Like you are not someone who transmits the virus. If you keep yourself on medicines and you 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 uh, you stay and remain undetectable. So the bottom line is like there is so much hope that just hearing my voice to say there is so much hope and the data, not just me, the data say that it's going to all be great. And so you just have to sort of understand that, embrace that there's something that there's something different, that there's something different than what you had before you had HIV, but that it's just going to be background noise. It doesn't have to be the, the the main music. It can just be the background music. And that's what I think people will tell you. Eventually, it's in the background. It's not at the front. For a while, it's at the front. And that's just it. It's not wrong. You just have to live your life and figure it out. And like, you know, talk to people, talk, you talk to a therapist, talk to your doctor, talk to your friend, practice disclosing until you can disclose comfortably. How is that for advice? Well, listen, if that is not the definition of turning positive into a plus, <laughs> I don't know what the hell is. Dr. Dimitri Daskalakis, thank you so, so much for joining us for this episode of Plus Talk. Unfortunately, that's all the time we've got, but I could talk to him forever and ever. If you want more information on anything we've talked about today, check out our website, pluslifemedia.com. And don't forget to follow us across all social media platforms. We are at Plus Life Media. That's it. In the meantime, wash your hands, wear a mask, stay safe. We'll see you next time. Thank you.